you hear the names Vincent van Gogh, Sylvie Plath, Mozart, Amy Winehouse, and Michael Jackson, what's the first thing that comes to mind? Is it a specific painting, a song, a book, or could it be perhaps their everlasting legacy, or maybe, maybe even the tragedy of their lives? Throughout time, we have been told stories of these so-called tortured artists, the artists who go to unimaginable lengths to perfect their craft, whom, by sheer dedication and spiraling obsession, transforms their torments into the greatest piece of work, a magnum opus. What we also often hear about these creatives is their unfortunate but believed to be inevitable deaths linked to their pursuit of perfection. Today, I'd like to propose to you the idea that maybe the concept of the tortured artist extends far beyond the boundaries of the art world, actually. In fact, I believe that each and every one of us students alike, there is a tortured artist. Well, what exactly is the tortured artist, you may ask? The tortured artist is a long-running trope across pop culture of the mad and often depressive genius who turns their own pain into masterpieces. The general consensus stemming from this stereotype is that true creativity is born out of suffering, that in order to reach great heights of artistic achievement, one must be tormented or mentally unstable. This is believed to be a rather harmful stereotype, especially amongst younger generations, as many believe it contributes to the romanticization of mental illness. Now, that really makes me wonder, is there any truth behind this stereotype? The ancient Greek philosopher Aristotle once said, there is no great genius without a touch of madness, which is something that many of the ancient Greeks believed in, and if I'm being completely honest with you, so did I. I too believe the reason why these artists and writers and singers that I looked up to were so great at what they did and were able to reach the level that they are at was because of their suffering. In a way, I wanted to be like them, and in order to do that, I too wallowed in my own suffering, refusing to get better, because I believed in some strange and twisted way almost that my suffering somehow may be better than others. But research by professors from the psychology department at Goldsmiths, as well as student Kaylee Smith, proves otherwise. The study looked at a sample of 290 creative professionals examining their creative behaviors as well as emotions over a two-week period. And by the end of that two-week period, the study found that participants were increasingly creative on days when they felt a strong sense of well-being and positive emotions, and significantly less creative on days with negative emotions, entirely contradicting the stereotype of the tortured artist. However, aside from being just tortured, the artist is also obsessive, prioritizing their artistic dedication almost always at the expense of their own personal well-being. Some popular examples in film would be the character of Nina Sayers from Black Swan, a ballerina whose obsession intensifies as she works to perfect the role of Swan Queen, and Andrew Naiman from Whiplash, an aspiring jazz drummer who's pushed to his limits by his abusive instructor. At the core, these two characters are driven by one thing, and that is the desire to be great. They're wholly consumed by their creative pursuits to the point of their own self-destruction. But how does this relate to our own lives? Well, in today's hyperproductive world, the culture of overwork is pervasive, combining long hours and constant busyness as badges of honor. It is important we recognize that this is a mentality which breeds a toxic cycle of exhaustion, where we're encouraging individuals to sacrifice their physical and mental well-being in pursuit of external validation and success. More often than not, the effects of our toxic world culture is not pretty. Take, for example, Kuroshi, Japan's infamous overworking epidemic causing countless of deaths by heart attack, stroke, and over 2,900 deaths by suicide in 2022. Yet, this issue extends far beyond Japan's borders, 
is a global pandemic affecting individuals worldwide. A joint study conducted by the World Health Organization as well as International Labor Organization found that in 2016, 488 million people worldwide were exposed to the risk of overworking. And in that same year, 745,000 people died from overwork. Let those numbers sink in for a second. Although the study does not cover the recent years, the author of the WH article notes that the issue of overwork is still on the rise. It is no wonder that in a world which glorifies hustle culture and relentless productivity that students experience burnout, stress, depressive episodes, and much worse. Trying to balance academics, a social life, and resting is a constant struggle that a majority of our students face and is something I find best represented by this image. As you can see, here we have good grades, social life, and enough sleep. However, it seems as though you cannot have all three at once, you must only choose two. And more often than not, the one that many choose to give up is enough sleep. In fact, overworking has become so normalized and even glorified in our culture that when you hear friends talk about how they only had three hours of sleep, it's not a cause of an alarm, but in fact triggers a sort of opposite response, which is comment on how you had even less sleep than they did and how much more tired you are. I often find myself playing into this toxic world culture when I'm complaining but I'm actually bragging about the many continuous nights and sleepless nights that I've spent studying, which is something I know many of you can probably relate to as well. I also know many of you are probably tired of being lectured to about the effects of sleep deprivation, so I'm just going to keep it short. The main six symptoms of sleep deprivation include lack of energy, slow thinking, having a reduced attention span, worsened memory, poor or risky decision making, and mood swings, which include feelings of stress, anxiety, irritability, etc. Additionally, Chronic sleep duration can increase risk of cardiovascular disease, diabetes, obesity, immunodeficiency, hormonal abnormalities, depression, anxiety, bipolar disorder, and the list goes on and on, but I don't see a reason why I should bore you with the what, you know, what's going to happen if you, if you do this and that. Instead, I would like to ask you, why are you doing this to yourself? Why do we put ourselves through this every single day? And I'm not, just not, I'm not just talking about not sleeping to chase deadlines. I'm asking, why do you wake up in the morning? Why is it that you make a consistent effort to show up every day? Why are you putting yourself through all of this pain to achieve this thing, whatever it is that you want? You might say, well, I want good grades. Oh, I want to be rich by 20, or I want to make my parents proud. But if we dug just a little deeper, what we'd find at the core of our motivations, the fundamental thing that drives us, that drives all of us, is the desire to be great. At the core, we know different from Nina Sayers or Andrew Naiman, they're simply a reflection of our own human nature and act as a warning for all of us. Therefore, that is why we have to be so careful as to not follow in their path of self-destruction because the disease of perfectionism can often disguise itself in the most subtle of ways. And once you're entirely consumed by that desire to be great, there is no going back. Because by then, you have not only ruined your own health, but also torn apart the relationships that matter the most, as well as ruin that very thing that you were chasing in the first place. The thing is, it doesn't have to be this way, and I think for the most of you, your relationship with work might not be even anywhere near the extent to which I'm talking about. However, it's still important that we recognize our own toxic behaviors from time to time and encourage a more positive approach to working. Certain symptoms of overworking to look out for in yourself as well as the people around you include feeling distracted, lack of energy, sleep disorders such as insomnia, having a disregard for the importance of sleep, 
mood swings with negative self-talk, having a weakened immune system, and finally difficulties balancing a social and work life. In the end, what can we learn from the tortured artists? The truth is, it's only natural to desire perfection and pursue our passions with intensity because it is a fundamental part of our human nature. Just like the obsessed and tortured artists, we all want to be the best at whatever it is that we do, whether it be art, a sport, or in school, and push ourselves to the limit in order to achieve the best possible results. Trying to balance academics, a social life, and resting again, is a constant struggle that the majority of the students face, and it is a struggle that's fueled by that desire to be great, that pursuit for perfection, perfection which drives the tortured artist. When you take the time to really examine the details, the romanticization of the artist being a constant state of suffering for their art, and the glorification of our people breaking their backs night and day to feed this idea of productivity are really just two sides of the same coin. It is time for a paradigm shift in how we define success and value in student life. By now, we should understand that pain is not synonymous with creativity, and neither does success go hand in hand with academic achievements. So instead of perpetuating the myth of the tortured artist, we must embrace imperfection and cultivate self-compassion. So take that break. Treat yourself to a good meal. Get those extra hours of sleep in if you must. Listen to your body and take care of it. I urge you to. Because at the end of the day, the basis of success is built on a healthy mind and body. And without those things, there is no groundwork for success. Thank you.